This is his story. This is a model of my F-86D in England with all the same markings that I had in England with the checkerboard squadron that was in with the Queen. And uh, this was the 8060 with the radome here, and the ro rocket pod is here holding 24 rockets. And that's what I was supposed to shoot down a UFO with. And this is my favorite airplane. <laughs> and this is my favorite airplane. I love that. Welcome to the channel, guys. I'm Chris Lato, retired F-16 pilot, now turned UFO investigator. Very interested in this case with Milton Torres from 1957. So after 50 years, his written statement was released by some documents from the National Archives out of MOD in the UK in 2008. So he hadn't said anything, hadn't spoken about it until that time. And now this interview popped up. For this video, I reference uh, the video, thanks to Eyes on Cinema YouTube, that's awesome, and Rich Bradley YouTube channel. So I love YouTube in general. So I use those two channels for interview references. And he also wrote a detailed written statement. So I'll also use that as well. I use Digital Combat Simulator. Okay, this is a powerful simulator now to try and put you in the seat of that F-86D aircraft back in 1957. It's a pretty crazy story. Really enjoy it. Hope you guys like it as well. Smash that like button if you do like this content. If you like this type of fighter content with DCS especially, subscribe to get notifications of my videos. And if you want to support the channel even further, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato, get behind the scenes access, join the team. Now let's get to the video. Chris Lato, welcome to Lato Files. When I first came to Manston, the first thing we had to do was to quote, transition to the new airplane. Well, I was already transitioned. I was uh, trained at Perrin Air Force Base in Texas, which did nothing but train F-86D pilots. Okay, when I got there, we had everybody in the squadron had to get up to speed at the same level. We went, fired rocketry at Tripoli. We did all kinds of things. Once we finally knew what we were doing, so they say, they put us on alert. That We had to take a share of the alert. This is for the RAF and the USAF, depending on whoever, which airplanes were on, on duty. We would be on alert, waiting to be scrambled. So the date was May 20, 1957. It was a typical English night in Kent, wrote Dr. Milton Torres, then an F-86 Delta fighter pilot. So a typical night in Kent apparently means completely cloudy skies, okay? The soup, he calls it. I saw this also in Korea, is basically just there's precipitation in the air, and no matter how high you climb, it looks like you're gonna climb above it, you can't, it's just all white. So that is the soup, as the ex-pilot referred to it, the thick cloudy weather went from the surface up to above 32,000 feet. Milton was a 25-year-old lieutenant in the Air Force at the time, the US Air Force, but his squadron was stationed in England. At this base, Manston, so RAF Manston Station, was an F-86D base. You can see right where it is, right? It makes sense. This is at the height of the Cold War, essentially, or Korean War, 1957. Milton was sitting alert in the new F-86D interceptor. So this is a new interceptor. His wing, the 406th Fighter Interceptor Wing, had committed to having F-86Ds stand alert, ready to launch and shoot down the Soviet bomber threat on five-minute notice. So this is the Delta. You'll notice it differs from the F-86, okay? The original F-86, this is the Saber, right? Looks like the MiG-17. I mean, it just has a hole in the front and six guns, so three 50 cal machine guns on each side. This is the original F-86. There's Chuck Yeager with Jackie Cochran. Okay, so this is the original F-86, first, first jet fighter, really, Korean War type thing. But he is actually flying the Delta, okay? So while the original F-86 Sabre was a day fighter, the Air Force designed the F-86D as an all-weather interceptor, which meant it was designed around a radar, okay, to deliver a specific ordnance. So the ordnance actually is this, the Mighty Mouse 
Unguided air-to-air -air missile was usually fired in salvos from U.S. Navy and Air Force jet fighters. The fins unfolded when the rocket left its firing tube or pod. A single hit by one of these small missiles could destroy an enemy bomber. So these are, they built the whole plane around this rocket. And if you look, it would hang underneath. How cool is that, man? It's like something out of James Bond or something. So these rockets would shoot out. These are a little over a meter long. And it was all directed by this fighter radar. Okay, so they trained very specifically to do that. Air combat under instrument conditions such as in the clouds and at night is complicated and very, very dangerous. I can tell you that from experience. So Milton wrote, two F-86Ds were on five-minute alert at the end of the runway at RAF Station Manston, awaiting the signal to scramble. I can remember the call to scramble quite clearly. However, I cannot remember specifics such as actual vector to turn after takeoff. Milton wrote. So Milton is out on the ramp. He's basically on a five minute alert. Normal scrambles, he says, is just to help someone or they want to check something out or it was a normal thing. Airliner has an issue, an emergency, but this night was different. So let's listen to that. That's usually what happened. When I got this scramble, this is a different story. We were at the end of the runway in our alert shack, waiting for a scramble order, and I got it. It was somewhere near midnight. I remember the exact time, but it was very close to midnight. I scrambled, we got into the airplane, and took off. The minute I took off, I checked into the GCI site, which was given to me when I took off, and the GCI advised me to pick up a heading of 120, and go gate, which I was already at gate, which means going to afterburner all the way. The, the, the soup was so thick, you couldn't see any lights, you couldn't see anything. Uh, it, was the, it was a set of clouds that went from the ground up to 32,000 feet, and I couldn't see a thing. It was one of these pea soup fogs that they had in England at the time. So Milton launched with his wingman, right? From RAF Manston, located here on the southeast corner of England, and flew east over the ocean. Okay, so he says 120. So basically they're just climbing up to 32,000 feet in the clouds, he says. So he says he basically never saw it, got out of the clouds. It was all the way up to 32,000 feet. His wingman was actually five miles behind him. The initial briefing, he says, indicated that the ground was observing for a considerable time a blip that was orbiting the East Anglia area. Milton wrote, so somewhere up here, right, he gets some call that there's something up here, but it's kind of an interesting contact. There was very little movement, he says, and from my conversation with the GCI controllers, the ground control intercept controllers, all the normal, normal procedures of checking with all the controlling agencies revealed this was an unidentified flying object with very unusual flight patterns. In the initial briefing, it was suggested to us that the bogey actually was motionless for long intervals. So that's quite interesting. The ability to stay motionless in the air is just not normal. It's quite fascinating to me as a pilot. Milton continues, the exact turns and maneuvers they gave me were all predicated to reach some theoretical point for a lead collision course type rocket release. So it's all to release those rockets. Milton continues, I can remember reaching the level of 32,000 feet and requesting to come out of afterburner only to be told to stay in afterburner. It wasn't very much later that I noticed my indicated Mach number was almost 0.92. That is about as fast as the F-86D could go, straight and level. Then the order came to fire a full salvo of rockets at the UFO. To be quite candid, I almost shit my pants. That's what he writes. So awesome, man. Even the wording, I can tell his words he uses. He talks like a fighter pilot. This, I mean, this guy, I believe, was a fighter pilot. And it sounds like a competent one. 0.92, the jet couldn't go any faster than that. That was the max speed that the actual F-86 could go. He mentions in here, it's hot load. I'll show here in a sec. He says it's a hot load. Milton wanted to confirm the order was not false and authenticated the controller by asking for specific codes from a sheet. So how do you authenticate is you have a code, right? Based on a certain sheet, everybody hands out the same sheets. And now you just read, okay, what's this under this number and letter? You read over and down or down and over down and over, uh, and you come to a certain two-letter identifier, you know, basically they would say 7-alpha, and you'd come back golf uniform, whatever it is, whatever it reads. So he authenticated back to the controller to say, hey, is this legit? Am I really going to fire live weapons? And they said yes. Okay, so after that, it's quite interesting. 
the minute I got airborne, there was, there was actually before I got airborne, they in, indicated this would be a hot fire measure. Hot fire? I turned and he says, you will be ordered to fire 24 rockets. Well, that's a very uh, heavy order. The, the kind of order that you de demand an authentication. So I picked up my little matrix and, and went through the authentication procedure and I looked down and they gave me two letters. Uh, they said, yes, this is our problem. That means I have to fire. From that moment on, it was, I, I didn't know what to hope. This was either a Russian or some aircraft that they wanted to shoot down. Ooh! Man, I can, I can imagine that, actually. Uh, dropping live weapons, yeah, definitely ups the level. You're in a high stress level right then. So Milton lines up on the UFO in his attack round. Okay, he'll explain in a second. He wrote, though, the blip was burning a hole in the radar with its incredible intensity. It was similar to a blip I'd received from B-52s and seemed to be a magnet of light. So this is the cockpit of a Delta, okay? It didn't have it in DCS yet, but this is that big radar scope. And what he's talking about, it's locked on, so it's just going to be straight up and down. And he gets some range circles to basically tell him when he's in range, in, in azimuth and angle to fire. So I think he's using this as his director. And what happens is he's basically lined up. Everything's closing down. It's about ready to fire. He's holding down the button to actually re launch the rockets automatically. Okay, so the system actually determines if it's ready to release. 20 seconds from rocket release, Milton tells the controllers, standing by, so everything's ready. It's all depressed, and right before he's going to reach an actual weapon solution and the rockets will release, basically the UFO just takes off at an unimaginable speed. Do you have a tally-ho? The controllers asked. If you could see the object, he says, I'm in the soup, and it's impossible to see anything. Milton replied, so let's check that out now. There is F-86. And he would have been in the Delta model. That front radon. Imagine flying just in the clouds, totally in the clouds. I can't even do it, really. And he, right down here, where that flashlight is, he would have his radar screen. Basically he flew out on his vector. He's got his flashlight out. Like he said, we would say now modern fighter terms would be, I was all asses and elbows. That's what he would have said. It's funny how the vernacular has changed. He said, I felt like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. Now I would have said I was all asses and elbows. So as you're looking around the flashlight, trying not to crash, keeping your jet straight, He's told now to actually turn 90 degrees, it sounded like, kind of like an in-place turn. His wingman was behind him five miles. So he turns 90 degrees, aiming his weapon, which is gonna be this main radar screen. And he says what it was, was the brightest contact he'd ever seen. He locks on using his lock-on switch here. And then he goes to shoot, he's counting down, actually has his button depressed. So actually the rockets will auto fire when the computer selects it. And at the last second, whatever the giant contact was, the strongest radar lock he'd ever had in his life, flew away at an unimaginable speed. He said much faster, Mach 10 at least, which is just insane. They, they advised me, look uh, on your port side at about uh, 15 miles, that's where it's at. Sure enough, there it was. As big as I said before, as big as an aircraft carrier as far as the blip was concerned. It was an easy lock on, very easy. My radar was telling me that I was giving, I got about 200 knot overtake on them over what he was going. And I was going at Mark point, uh, 0.92 and uh, we're being well, Mark 1 would be around 750. We couldn't go that fast. At any rate, I had a a solid lock, and now uh, came in the target, and uh, it gives you a circle on the radar, and uh, in that circle, they have another little circle, and it has the jizzle band. The jizzle band 
is the, is the, the band you see on the radar when it goes round and round, except in our case it was held still because I was locked on. Anyway, as I was going in, uh, I looked up there, my overtake was holding at about uh, 250 to 300 knots, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, closure rate. And then all of a sudden, uh, I got the, the, the started to shrink. This means uh, I'm, I'm going to tell him, I said, Judy, you know, which means to them that uh, I've got to complete the intercept on my own. I'm ready to fire. I pulled the trigger and nothing happened, but it, it was coming in and just about two or three seconds to go, it's supposed to go into a flat line where I just put the, 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 the dot on the, on the line and the, the radar takes over all computations and fires the missiles if I have it depressed. Well, that didn't happen. Next thing I know, I look up, I see the Gisel band was in center, and this blip was going straight north, straight away from me, and uh, away from me, and it was going at, at I estimate, Mach 10, because it was so fast. And the, the RAF told me this time that we've lost our our target, it went off our, tar uh, our radar completely, we have a 250 mile scope and he's gone. And I said, well, he's gone with me too. He's, uh, it's out, he's out of range. I'm returning and going home. So I did, and, I, and they back to be the home plate. At any rate, when, that's when they told me that uh, call me on the landline, and I got the rest of the information on the landline. Then they told me that the, 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 the British sent, were sending somebody down from London to debrief me. So at about 10 seconds to release, right, everything was fine. It, this UFO had been there for long enough, at least for them to detect it, to talk about it, to launch the fires, to get there. And yet, you know, seconds from actual weapon solution, the thing just takes off. So pretty amazing. At about 10 seconds to release, that's when Milton noticed the numbers started changing. This is from his written account. His overtake pegged at 200 knots was now negative overtake of 200, the maximum negative overtake possible. Milton wrote, my impression was that whatever the aircraft or spacecraft was, it must have been traveling at two digit Mach numbers greater than 7,000 miles per hour to have done what I had witnessed. So with no target in sight, Milton head, headed home and landed without incident. So he writes this, I had not the foggiest idea what had actually occur occurred, nor would anyone explain anything to me. The next day, a sergeant in the squadron took Milton to a hallway, so pulls him out aside, and a civilian appeared from nowhere he wrote the civilian looked like a well-dressed ibm salesman with a dark blue trench coat he immediately jumped into asking questions about the previous day's mission after my debriefing of the events he advised me that this would be considered highly classified and that i should not discuss it with anybody not even my commander i have not spoke of this to anyone until the recent years that was the end of his written account let's see what he says uh, in his interview and yeah, that's all that happened that day I landed, went home. The, the next morning, I went to work, and the, this guy, the, the spook, comes in, and uh, Ron Kane brings him to me, and I had no idea who he was or what. Anyway, he flashed a card that wasn't a national security, but it was an official government bag, and I, so I expected it might be CIA. Well, who knows what it was? He was a spook. That's all I knew. So I told him the whole story. And he told me, no uncertain term, don't tell anybody this has been declared top secret. And if you open your mouth to anybody, that includes your commander or your wingman or anybody else, if you open up your mouth to anybody, and it says, we'll get you off of flying status. That was enough for me to be quiet for the rest of the time. Wow, look at that. So the men in black actually wear dark blue trench coats. What he said, not not black. What do you guys think of that? I think it's uh, quite compelling, man. All his word, everything he uses, the actual account, the way he wrote it, his, his preciseness with certain things, certain, certain details, how he talks, even his cussing, you know, really seems like this is a legit and compelling case. So you have something very large, very, very large that was picked up by ground radars. So the RAF ground control intercept could actually see it right, and was able to direct his aircraft onto it. So you had, it was seen by the ground radars and it was picked up by his fighter radar, okay? So if you're talking about jamming, 
how do you jam multiple different radars at different angles in different frequencies? Very, very difficult and not like that, okay? That is possible in certain minute instances, but you know, I was electronic attack expert for four years at the aggressors, and I can tell you it's very difficult in 1957. I don't see how that would happen and accelerate away. I mean, amazing. This guy obviously thinks he was fighting something real out there. It sounds like it sounds like he was. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Hope you enjoy the video. If you do like it, let me know in the comments. Smash that like button. It really helps the algorithm. And then subscribe to get notifications. If you want to support the channel, you want to go further, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lado to support the channel. I totally appreciate it. All of my patrons. And finally, we have the UAP Society. You'll hear no other advertisements on this channel except for what we're trying to do, the actual UAP Society. Go to UAPsociety.com if you are interested in our NFT project to get data about UAPs. All right, guys. Have a great week. Peace.